and we're very honored, we're proud and privileged to welcome her here today. Please give a huge round of applause to Dr. Auma Obama. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here. Every time when I'm introduced, I look over my shoulder and ask, who is that? Who are they talking about? I don't know this person. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So, I'm going to try and talk about your topic, but I may stray a little bit because um, I already just sat and asked Ms. Siemens, um, early childhood development, what age are you talking about? And she replied, when is early? So stay with me, bear with me as I talk. Remember, I put the question to you, when is early? You're going to watch some pictures going by and some slogans that I use within the work I do to portray what it is we try to achieve. Don't mind the picture so much, it's in a loop. So you'll see the picture several times and the messaging I hope will come through as I speak so that you understand the context of the, the messages up there. So what skills and abilities do children need for a worthwhile future? That's a very heavy, loaded question because we're talking skills, we're talking abilities, and we're talking about a worthwhile future. What is a worthwhile future? It's relative. You've just heard from the panelists who reported back from the workshops that there were a wide range of differences in what was understood as you know, worthwhile, as the proper kind of learning. So it's always relative. Don't forget that. So as I speak to you, I always try to start with myself because I think I'm an example of what it is I'm trying to do with the community that I work with. I'm not saying I'm super successful. I'm not saying I know it all. I'm just trying to say that certain things were aligned in a certain way that enabled me to get to where I got to and enabled me, what I consider, to succeed. The first thing, and also hindered my success and slowed it down. Those who come from the continent of Africa will understand. So I'll talk about my identity first. My identity, my early childhood development, is seeped in the image of a continent that is seen as dependent and passive. Why do I say this? I say this because when one talks of Africa as a continent, outside of Africa and inside Africa as well, no to those of you who come from there, we talk of this continent as if it's a country. Very many times you hear people saying, in German I know it well because I speak German, das Land, and I'm, I always kind of cringe every time because I'm, I'm used to being very sensitive to this. And I've heard it from people from the continent saying the country. I think it's a slip of the tongue. I prefer to see it that way. And indeed, we are seen as being dependent and poor as a whole continent because our association with the West is one that is basically in the forefront seen as one in regards to development aid. Development aid, classical development aid, and I say this again and again, again for those who've heard me talk, has, the, has had the ability to make people become beggars. And I'm saying it knowing full well that I also get supported, so we'll continue to discuss it. A community of beggars who constantly expect to be given and who are actually playing the waiting game because hoping and thinking they'll get something if they're in the right place at the right time. I talk, for example, of slums where we have a lot of people in the slums who, in my opinion, could go back to their ancestral homes where there's a lot of beautiful land that they can cultivate and feed themselves. But, as I was told as I, when I once complained about this, and also, why don't people just go back to their ancestral home instead of being stuck in places like Kibera, Madare, Korokocho, all the slums that I can name in Nairobi, and there are some also in Kisumu as well. And I was told, no, they don't go back because rural poverty is not obvious. If my child is suffering hungry in the rural area and a foreigner comes, all they see is the beautiful landscape and they don't see the poverty. But in the slums, it's obvious. And I stay there in the hope that my child or my family will be picked for whatever organization is currently there. We have at least in one slum 400 organizations that are working there or more doing NGO work. So they hope they'll be picked and they call it a waiting game. I call it playing the lotto and waiting for slum tourism to save them. So that's the first obstacle, that's the first part of my identity that I have to deal with. And I say this because I also studied abroad. And that was the only identity that was known. 
So I was confronted constantly with trying to explain away that no, we're not as passive as we seem, we're not all beggars, and our continent is not a bottomless, bottomless pit that you keep putting input into, financial input, and nothing comes out and nothing changes. But on the other hand, the bottomless pit is a reality, so let's not pretend it's not. All the aid, all the support we've gotten, still, when you talk of this continent, you're talking about trying to help it, it needing to come out of this miserable situation of poverty, conflict, and disaster. So this legacy is problematic. When I am thinking of how I work with children and young people, ECD, Early Childhood Development, Early Childhood Education, I think immediately of that as well, because that legacy is what I pass on. And with that kind of a legacy, pretty heavy, I don't think you can do very well. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you. It's a struggle to come out of that. And that's why I consider myself a success, because that's my background. That's what I was given to start my life with. And I then turn it around and say, actually, I was given a lot because I lived in a world of several cultures that make up me and make up my development and is a plus. But that still has to be learned by ourselves and by the rest of the world. So this problematic definition of us, poverty, actually, if you go onto Wikipedia, you will find when they define development aid, the examples and the focus is on Africa, which actually really upset me because I did it as a test just to see and I, I proved myself right, and it really, really irritated me. And again, because of the work I do with children and young people. And children and young people, they're from the ages, these are the parents, we work with them as well, I'll explain why. The children, we start with the age of four, that's why I asked the question about the age. From age, and we go until 25. And this learning and development continues throughout to 25. I want to challenge anybody who says, I will work with the children, they're little, and afterwards they are fine. It doesn't work that way. I don't know if it does in Europe, I've not been in that space, but I know for the work I do, and I work in rural Kenya, it doesn't work that way. So we start at four, four, and we continue until they become successful young adults who financially, psychologically, socially, and economically are doing okay. That is what we try and do. But then again, back to the beginning, development aid and how we see Africa as a place that needs helping. What it's done to us, a great majority of us, and even those of us who can help ourselves, we've got a mindset, a mentality of being victims. We cannot help ourselves because we're poor and because we've been, we're getting the help anyway. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to prove anything for it. And there's also a sense of entitlement. You owe me, be it because you colonized me, be it because, you know, whatever. But actually, it's no longer the colonial owe me. It's just the owe me because I'm poor, because we've taken on that coat of poverty and worn it and are quite comfortable in it. And the reason really is, is because people are used to a lower standard of living. In my culture, we have a saying, Angiyogi Kech, which means I'm used to hunger. Angiyogi Kech. And these are adults saying this. They're used to being hungry. They're used to poverty. And because they're used to it, if you give them something a bit better, they're fine. And if you take it away, they're fine as well. And that's a tragedy when you think of the children. Because these are adults who say this. And this is what we try to fight in the work that I do by Sautiku, Powerful Voices. We try to redefine poverty. Because as I say to them and to anybody who's willing to listen, poverty is relative. I know, having lived in the West, that in the Nordic countries, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, you pay a lot of money to go and live in a hut with no electricity, no running water, and a, a plums claw, what is it called? Pit latrine. You know, but in my culture, when you live like that, people say they're poor. And they're defined as poor. And they live in a hut we have here. If you look, you have seen some huts. They're the most coolest, the most nicest places to be because the temperature is so high. And actually what we did was we put cement, put in electricity wires, and now you have electricity in there. So the young people actually can stay there and study there when they're doing exams. So poverty is relative. We try to define poverty and tell the people, you are not poor. You have been told you're poor, but look around you and really ask yourself, are you poor? And this is the rural community I'm talking about because when you go to the slums, it's a different story. But then you ask the question, do you need to be there? But it's another story for another time. So first of all, redefining poverty. Redefining what development aid is. What is development aid, actually? What does this mean? 
because you might say, oh, this is rather far-fetched. We're talking about early childhood development. But these children you work with are coming from that mentality. And they're coming from the mentality that when I started working in my region, if a white person, preferably middle-aged, with graying, a beard, if possible, before it used to be in these Birkenstock sandals, now we've institutionalized that, like the Green Party, we do wear suits and stuff. But that was the image, the development aid worker was the one who was going to help. So when I came along, African, a woman, coming from the same area, so who do I think I am, trying to start an organization to work with them, and then on top of them telling them they're getting nothing for free, they weren't really interested. That's not development aid. That's not development aid. What is she coming here to do? So then I challenge, what is development aid? What are you doing? You must develop somebody from something to somewhere, from one place to the other. My linguistic background tells me the word development in itself means nothing until you put a noun to it. Development to what, from what? So this is where we challenge, what does that mean, development aid? The other thing we challenged was the mindset, this victim mentality where you do not become a player in your own destiny. You let others take care of you. This mindset, our children see it. They see it and they take it on. They take on that mantle of poverty and of, of being a victim. And I know they do because the last retreat we have at, had at the center, we decided to discuss uh, the elections, if you all know what's happening in Kenya currently. And that was after the first elections. And we had the children do uh, uh, pieces, drama, skits, about the election, around the election. Excuse me, I need some water. Around the election. And they did plays. And these children reflected exactly what was going on in the country. And I say we work from children, with children from 4 to 25 years old. Exactly what's happening in the country. And you could even recognize which politicians they were imitating. And we think the children don't know what's happening. Because they're just kids. No, they're not just kids. Something that my sister-in-law said the other day in an interview in a, in a summit that we were at together. She said that her growing up, was that her parents were bringing up young adults and not children. So you who do early childhood development, think of that. We were bringing up young adults and not children. So they were never treated like they were just kids. And I think there's a level of stigmatization of being a child in the West, which maybe should be challenged. Because when you're a child, it immediately means you have no say, you're being looked after, you're weaker, you know, you don't have to take responsibility, your parents have to, they pay because they have to do whatever you want, you know. And this mentality means that the child basically becomes what I'm talking about here, passive, you know, take, 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 and actually feel a sense of entitlement. So you have to consider that when you're working with these little ones, that you're bringing up young adults. If you keep that always at the back of your mind, I think you'll get it a bit righter. And their mindset, you can work better with their mindset. Because even coming out of a situation where you've been taught your continent is a country, it's full of poverty and misery, and people don't manage to do their own thing, if you think of that young person, that child, as a young adult, you will start training them to take responsibility. Because that's what Sautiku does. We train the young people to take responsibility from a very young age. Because what we say is that if a child has a glass or is playing at the table with the water and drops the glass, and the glass drops and cracks, the child will kind of like get scared and think, oh my god, I'm going to get in trouble. That means that child knows what right is and wrong is. And the moment you know the difference between right and wrong, you must take responsibility. So you do not exempt children from responsibility. It doesn't matter how young they are. They must start then already. Because suddenly at 18, and that's what we tend to do, is to tell our kids, you're grown up now, you should know better. What were you doing all those years? They should have known better from that very early age. Because then it's natural to them, you know. I say that I'm also human. My daughter hates tidying up. She's the messiest child I know. And I keep kicking myself for not training her when she was little to be tidier. Because now as a young adult, she'll do it because I want to, but I know her heart's not in it. And the minute I turn my back, it's a mess again. So that's not teaching. That's not learning. You can't wait with children. I think that's the key thing about early childhood development is you cannot wait. You must start from day one. Otherwise, you're going to have a much, much harder time trying to teach these children. So early childhood development, in my opinion, that's why I think I am qualified to stand here and talk about it, although I run an organization and not a school, it starts everywhere. 
from all dimensions of a child's life. One of the other things that is important for us with these children and their families, because that's the other thing, we do not leave out the family. In the work that we do, and that's why you've seen pa parents, is we include the parents. And the way we include them also is very interesting because we do not work with adults who do not have children with us. So we're actually telling them, we're investing in your children, but you come along and see what we're doing because you need to be part of the conversation. Because we can teach this child to be the most fantastic young person, the most fantastic leader, but if at home they're still being put down, then we've done nothing. So we are creating spaces, but the key space is in the home. So even with early childhood development, you can do whatever you do in the trainings, in the institutions. If the family is not on board, you will kill everything that you have created because the children first and foremost listen to their parents, even if they pretend not to, even if they rebel. When they hear you are a nothing, you're useless, you can't do this, that sticks. And you know it from us adults because many times when you talk about the things that really impressed on us, it's coming from the family, it's coming from the home. And one of the things we do, and this we do with the parents in particular and the children in the work that we do is we talk about common sense. I love this common sense is for me a terminology that also drives what I do in my life. Because if something doesn't make sense, do not do it. It's as simple as that. How many politicians would benefit from that? Huh? Right? If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. In our context, it's about, for example, you see this, um, garden, it's a demonstration garden, where we show the families what they can grow, indigenous crops, so they don't complain and say, oh, we can't because. We just show them, well, you think you can't? Look, we're doing it, so you should be able to do it. They, we started this garden because we were looking for a way to show them how they can gain an income. Most important of that was also to put food on the table. Because the children used to come to us and they were hungry. So when we started the garden, they would come and speak to our ladies who are like a bit the mamas and they would be, you know, they've got big hearts and then they would allow them to go and pick uh, vegetables and fruit and different crops to take home to, to cook. And I said, that is not in order. And that's the other thing we do. We talk about the power of no. You should be able to say no because sometimes you think you're helping somebody by saying yes, but actually you're not. So we said, it doesn't make sense that you all have the same land that we are growing on. In fact, one of them is a neighbor of ours. And you're growing nothing on your land. It looks really nice, just bare, kind of nice countryside. But you don't have food, and you're coming to us for food. So we started a project called Grow to Eat, where we help the families establish kitchen gardens that they then could grow vegetables and fruit and cereal to put on the table a vegetarian meal. They could also, you know, they have goats and, and chickens and all that, but it was mainly a vegetarian meal. So they could feed, give the children a balanced meal, because without that balanced meal, the children are getting stunted, that's the one thing, and they can't learn properly because they're hungry. So the Grow to Eat project was to enable the children and young people to have food on the table. Again, we only worked with the parents of the children that are in our organization. But what we also did, it was the children who were to motivate their parents to come and establish kitchen gardens with us and work with us. So if your child hasn't invited you to come and join our organization, it seems kind of weird, right? You can't. What we do with that is we're empowering the children. Another key point for us. We talk about powerful voices, Sautiku. We empower children and young people to help with the decision-making process in what happens in their life. How powerful is it, is it when a grandchild goes and tells the grandma, we don't have any food, but look, we have land. At Sautiku, they'll teach you how to farm the land just so we can put food on the table. And it's a small little patch, a kitchen garden and your grandma comes, your parent comes, and afterwards when we're talking to them and we're getting testimonials, the grandmother says, I didn't think my child could teach me, but my child, my grandchild taught me. How powerful is that? Because what you then do by doing that is making the voices of the children valid. And that is something that we as adults forget to do. Make the voices of children valid. Because with a valid voice, they behave differently. When you have a voice, your voice is heard, then you have a responsibility to act a certain way. You have a responsibility to be proactive, and you have to stand by your voice. And that kind of responsibility is growth. That's what I call early childhood development. Because then you're de developing them towards becoming a, a strong adult who is responsible, who takes responsibility for their life, who understands that their future belongs to them. That is very, very key in the work we do. You are your future. We tell those children, young people, all the time. And it's not about development aid. And that's the problem. Another problem I have with development aid and our own institutions is that in my part of the world, most of the early development 
work is done, and, I, and you can you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is under the umbrella of development aid. NGOs have taken the responsibility for doing this. And this is something where I say we must fight against that, not because I want to put you all out of work and stop you doing what you're doing, the great work you're doing. It's because it's the responsibility of the government. It is one of our core rights to be educated properly. And in order to ensure that the education is quality education, because that's the other thing, people throw about the idea of, oh, we need to educate, you know, we need to do all this stuff, but we need to add the word quality to it. Because all of us can get an education, but is it quality education? Is it the right kind of education to move us forward in life and help us succeed? And this is also the responsibility of our governments. It's the responsibility of the country to look after its own young people. It shouldn't be done as something that is philanthropic. And that's, again, the thing about philanthropy and development, that is a problem, because if it's charity, if it's philanthropy, and somebody, you have a great, wonderful donor X who is contributing and giving your organization money for your early development program, if that person gets tired and says, oh, now I like little puppies, or the donkeys in Lamu, I hear that there are donkeys in Lamu that get beaten and there's an orphanage for donkeys, and I want to give money to that, you're not going to be able to stop them. And then what? And I've been in mainstream development because the minute the program stops, because there's no money, everything stops. You all lose your jobs. The locals are jobless, the kids are lost, and the, the expatriates, no offense meant, move on to the next organization. I call that uh, development aid uh, tourism. Because you go to the next organization. You see, and those things are wrong. Because then at the core of what you're doing is not really moving people forward. It's finding a status quo scenario and working within that scenario. So we need to push, the advocacy work that's done is to push to make this work mainstream. Early childhood development must be part of the regular uh, curriculum, the regular work that is being done by government, by the Ministry of Education, to enable kids to have a good start in life, a good academic start in life. Okay. And again, come back to development, I have to finish this. You know, it's something that I always say we need to talk more about. Development aid, charity, philanthropy. It has its place, and no doubt it does. We are a charity. There's nothing harder in my work than the fundraising because nobody wants to fund what I do very often. Well, no, let me not say that. Let me rewind. Of course people want to fund what I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Our executive director is here. I take that back. Uh, it's because I, <laughs> I have managed to be able to get this far because of the support I get. But if we keep labeling it philanthropy and charity, it's in the wrong place. Because charity, philanthropy belongs if you're going to boost something as a startup. Or when, for example, we're building, you see this space here, we're building a huge center for the, the kids and the rural community there. So we need that help. And it's philanthropic help because we are non-profit. We don't make money. Or when there's a disaster, when there's a catastrophe, you know, Houston, you know, take, you know, Puerto Rico, those sort of, or when Haiti, you know, all those are disasters where you have to give immediate help. But for long-term sustainable Growth, because we use the word growth as opposed to development, but I can use it too. For long-term sustainable development, you need something that is more consistent. Something that is not based on the fact that I like you, that's why I'm doing it. Or because, you know, I've given you pictures of, you know, kids with big bellies and, and running noses. You know, because that is the wrong basis. That is building your house on sand, and it doesn't work in the long term. We must not create different dependencies. We must not make people passive. And we must stop giving handouts even in the form of the programs that we do, including for early childhood development. And you know what? For those of you in that sector, challenge your donors. Challenge those people who give you money and, 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 and teach them, educate them. People are too afraid. People count numbers and tick boxes. And I always say, you need to make it clear to them because very often, and I get this a lot, I think my second name helps because people think I have access to so much knowledge and funds and all that, so um, yeah. But I get asked a lot, what can I do? How shall I do it? And I get asked by prominent people who actually can move things. And I always say that, you know, you must listen to those you're trying to assist. You must let them assist you to understand how your money is going to work or your support is going to work. That is what I do. So I create a space and I have that conversation because I have to stay true to what I'm trying to achieve 
for the, that is really a real picture. It's not pretense. We do use a small lawnmower, but one day we'll get a bigger one, right? Or really? So, you know, we have to make it clear that the work we are doing is not about, I'm showing the slum pictures now just to show where we move them from, because a good percentage of people who live in the slums have homes in that green leafy area in the rural area, but they don't go there. So what we're trying to show is that it's not enough to think that we're going to make the child's life better because one on one, your money is just going to the child. It's, you've also got to learn that there's a whole structure around it that has to be holistic, that includes children who look like this young lady looks, who look healthy, who are smiling, who look happy. She has issues. But if you show those pictures, the message you're telling her is that she has to look like a victim, she has to be a victim, and she has to be helped. And the idea that we have and what we're trying to do is make them powerful so they help themselves. So they see what they need to have done through themselves, through their families, through the environments that we create, so they don't end up being a burden forever and staying with us forever because they need to move on. We need to, t we are taking them where they are and then we move them onto a place where they can uh, survive on their own and their families too. That is very, very important. And what that means then, and again, I'm not forgetting the little people, but from the area where you work, this is where you're going. These children, these young people, must become part of the economic value chain. And that's why I don't talk about sustainable economic development, I talk about sustainable economic growth. Because they must, otherwise whatever you're doing makes no sense. Again, I'm talking about common sense. It makes no sense. Throwing a ball in the mix and saying, oh, that will work so well, you know, they're, they're gonna be really great leaders and all that, and then you stay for three years, and then after three years you're gone. If that child was early learning, Childhood development starts with three. If that child was three, you're gone by the time the child is six. What is that child got to look forward to after that? So it's, it really has to be for the long haul. And it has to be thinking about what is at the end of this tunnel. What is at the end of this journey? Don't just work with the little ones thinking, oh, somehow they'll manage after that. You know, we have in our country, you get primary school is for free, sort of, if you can pay for your uniform and your school shoes, etc. And secondary school, they're talking about making it free. And in my opinion, I'm like, the conversation hasn't even started because if you take a child through primary school and they go because it's free, what happens afterwards? So we have a lot of young people, early childhood development is not even part of the equation at this point, who have finished class eight and couldn't go further because there was no money, no funds, etc., and they're stuck. And they're stuck, so what they do is they repeat. And they repeat, and they repeat, and hope that they get better grades so that they can get a scholarship, a sponsorship of some sort, or they just repeat because the parent doesn't know what to do with them and is hoping things will change, things will get better. So the whole system has to work together. So it can't be just about the one without the other. They all, they're interlocked. They don't even complement each other because that's almost like we're doing it for fun and, you know, I have a choice here. There's no choice. It has to be done in a holistic way. It has to be done in a way that it combines all. Therefore, and hence I speak of making the, the, the movement around the, the, the work we do with children and young people, something, it, it has to be about being part of the uh, mainstream economic value chain. And that, I think, applies for everywhere, Europe and America, too. There are a lot of young people who are out of work. In England, I worked, there were a lot of young people at 16, they couldn't even spell their own names properly, and they could not do maths. And they would go, they, would, they, they, they had, a, and this was for me really, really sad, because in Europe, or in the West, Children and young people feel they should be successful, they should be happy, because they have everything. What on earth are they complaining about? I have in, young interns who come to Sautiku in Alego, in the countryside, and they're so apologetic about just being. You know, they'll go out for a drink with, with, with the other young people from the organization, and they're paying for everything, even though they don't have any money. And I'm asking them, Constantine, why are you paying for everything? Oh yeah, but I come from Germany, and in Germany, uns geht es so viel besser. We have it so much better. I say, we, but you, do you have money? No, not really. Well then, there's no difference. So people need to start being more realistic about the way they view, who, who am I? Where am I going? And what is helping me to get there? That's what Sautiku does. Who are they? What are we doing? And what are they doing to get themselves to a better place? And all of this, you all rightly know, starts with the little people, you know. It starts with the little people. And Sautiku's method, I see it as an alternative method and a value add to the mainstream school. We don't, we're not a school. We don't do the curriculum for school. We create a space, a safe space, a safe mental and physical space where the young people have a valid voice, the children have a valid voice, as I explained, and their parents 
have a valid voice because we include them in the circle. And the methods we use to do that is, for example, we have by personality development and character building, that is one of our pillars, and I'll tell you the reason why the parents have to be included, is, for example, we teach them about themselves. Very many children come from households, especially in the rural area, where there's so many. So mom is calling you Atiano and your name is Adhyambo or Jane, and you answer because she's so busy and so stressed, you know, and if you don't answer, she'll think you're rude and you'll get a smack. So you answer and get on with it. So your own personal identity doesn't figure so much. You get by and survive with everybody else. So what we teach them is they need to start being aware that they exist. I also do a lot of uh, children's rights work. They have to know that they exist as individuals and they have a right to exist and a right to be seen. That's the first thing before they even speak. And I don't know how much time I have, but I can ask you to look at your neighbor as a small exercise and look into your neighbor's eyes and then maybe somebody who, 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 who isn't afraid to can volunteer to tell me what they think they see in the eye of their neighbor. So if you just turn and look at each other two seconds and look into your neighbor's eyes and tell me what you see. Don't be embarrassed, it's okay. It's just for a few seconds. So, can anybody tell me? Can anybody tell me what they see in the eyes of their neighbor? Can anybody tell me what they saw? Just any one person can volunteer. Otherwise, my, my exercise doesn't work. Sorry? Tired eyes. You saw too much. You saw too much. We need to do it again. You, you, be, just focus. Focus when you look. Don't embarrass them, but focus when you look because you saw too much. So look again. Or really don't tell what it is they're supposed to see. Okay, she knows the exercise. Just look again, but focus. Have you seen? Okay, can anybody tell me what they saw? Blue eyes, the color of the eyes. Sorry? Happiness, okay. Anybody else? Your reflection? A wheel. Oh, okay, you saw, you, oh, you interpreted it. All right, okay. Okay, you all are too intellectual. <laughs> you're too intellectual, you're too deep. It's not, remember I work with kids, that's too deep. None of the kids will reply that. One more last time, sorry, I'm over taking too much time. One more last chance to you all, intellectuals. <laughs> Try again. And this time, simple. Think in the, put yourselves in the uh, four-year-olds. A four-year-old, go on, one more time, one more time, as a four-year-old. You wanna see mine? Okay, okay, can anybody give me, has anybody got an idea? Eyes, that's a good one, yes, not bad, yeah? Close, she saw a black dot in the middle. Friendship, too deep, that one's too deep. This is the four year old, four year old. Any? Circle, close, yeah. Sparkling. Anybody else? Hazelnut, the color. Oh, there you are. It's a nut, okay. But it's an interpretation, you know, that's a bit deep. Okay, I'm going to go with this closest. He talked about sparkling, okay? Now, one of the things about the eyes, and then I'll have you look at each other again. If you look in each other's eyes, you see a light. It's a white light. Look again. Sorry, I'm totally taking up too much time. Look again. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, good, okay. Okay, did you all see it? Did you see the white light? You all saw the white light. See, you all were too intellectual. There's a white light. And with this light, what we tell the children, oh, I won't even talk about what we tell the children yet. I'll tell you. Any of you who know about photography, about film, when you make a film or you take a photo, and I'm sure you all know because we're all taking selfies nowadays, you put the, 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 the film crew or the camera person puts a light and the protagonist gets a light for just their eyes. Do you know why? Does anybody know why? Mm. 
the light is reflected, yes. So you, the, the light is reflected, so they create the white light. Why do you think they create the white light? Have you been to one of my talks before? Wow, okay. That's it. Because you can say it again. I, you, you. Otherwise, you look dead. Did you hear? What happens when people die? What do we do? And what is it called when you do, do that? I know in German there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a term, a sentence that is said when that happens. What happens when they do that? I'll tell you. It's too much. I'm making it like a classroom. The light, <laughs> you know, um, the light has gone out. Your light has gone out, which means you're dead. So what we do with the children, we make sure that the children learn to talk to us, looking at us, because we need to see the light in their eyes to know that they are alive, to acknowledge their presence. Now, for those of you who come from our continent, you know how difficult it is, because you look your mother and the father in the eye, and they're like, what, this respectful child? To watch. Yeah, it sounds terrible, but really it's true. So what we are doing is trying to teach the children the balance between looking adults in the eye so they take, they're aware of you, but at the same time being respectful. It's quite an interesting exercise. And that's another reason why we work with the parents. Because the parents know what we are doing. So that we're trying to teach the children to take their space and at the same time have the parents learn to give them space. Because otherwise they're not learning to become responsible adults. They must participate and they must be they must be acknowledged. It doesn't matter whether that's a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. They must be acknowledged for who they are. I said earlier, teaching adults, young adults, to become adults. If you keep that in mind, then you have a different way to work with children. And I know, you know, as I go along, my daughter is now 20. And there have been so many times that I've kicked myself and said, oh gosh, I wish I'd known this earlier and I'd done it differently and I wish I could go back. Because there's so much that I know now that I know I didn't do when I was bringing up my daughter. But one thing I did do was I gave her a voice. So that's the other thing. We have the light, which is the eyes, then we have the voice. That's why we're called Sautikun. Because children often struggle to be heard. You know the little ones who are at your feet and they're trying to say, uh, and it's, uh, it's like you feel exhausted for them and nobody's paying attention. It happens to women too, by the way, just so you guys know. <laughs> you know, so that you be heard, that voice, you need to have that voice. And, I, and without shouting at them, that's the other thing. We tend to shout at kids. And I learned it. I, I won't say the hard way. It was a big shock because when my daughter was four, because I used to discipline her, I'd tell her, ah, you've got to do this. And one day she just said to me, Mama, when you shout at me, I don't hear you. And she's four. You know, and I'm thinking, wow, that's powerful. When you shout at me, I don't hear you. And from then I, start, and from then I started to talk to her. And we started to discuss issues. And I started to take her advice because she'd tell me something. And normally I'd be like, oh, don't worry. And then I would do my way. And then suddenly her way was the right way. And I should have actually listened to the little person before. So I learned also to start listening, to let her have her voice. Because another thing that happens is when you use your voice, you have to take responsibility. And this, again, is in the same vein, taking responsibility. And then there was the other thing, the fire. So it's light, the sound, the voice, your tone, and your fire. And the fire is your potential, what you can do. You must know that you have so much potential, so much of you that you can do so much with. And young people need to be told, need to be shown, need to be given the space. It's really, really important. And I guess, especially when you're talking about early childhood development, that's when they actually they have less inhibitions, they're more willing to try, they're, not, they're less afraid. So that potential, we need to affirm it again and again and again so that they get confident to be able to actually try. And unfortunately for our kids in the rural area, again with this background of, you know, where you're, the discipline means you don't talk, you know, being good means that you do as you're told to your own detriment sometimes because we know children are uh, abused, even sexually abused because they don't know how to say no. So it's teaching them to realize that, you know, you have a space, you have a voice, it's powerful. You can use it, and you have a lot to contribute. Very, very important. In the context of the voice, two things, and I think it was on the board, apart from the common sense, is the why, 
asking why, very, very important, and being able to say no. The power of why and the power of no. To my poor father's dismay, I grew up as a child always asking why. I was the only girl, and everything I wanted to do, I was constantly told, you can or cannot do because you're a girl. And I always asked, why? And the next thing would come in and ask why, and I wanted an answer. And I'd be told, don't ask, just do. And I would ask why. So my dad was pulling his hair out and telling me, why don't you just do as you're told? And I'm like, why? I need to know. So I always asked from a very young age. And it helped me a lot because it, things made sense to me when I was told why. I wasn't trying to be difficult. I was just trying to make sense of my world and make it make sense why, as a girl, I should do most of the chores in the house while my older brother was just two years older than me, didn't have to do anything. And you know, when you challenge the status quo, you change the status quo. And you change it towards yourself to make a better place for you. So that's what we teach them as well, to know their potential, to be able to use that potential and not be afraid. And in the process of all of this, we also support them in education, make sure they go to school. And again, the early childhood development and learning also includes working on the farm. The kids, all of them participate in everything we do. We don't make a difference in terms of their learning, the terms of the exposure. It's about quality, like I said early, earlier. It's about equity. So we don't, people tend to ask me, well, you're working with boys and girls, what are you doing for the girls? And I usually say, what I'm doing for the girls is I make sure they don't get left behind. But they also uh, have the same exposure as the boys. But we watch out that they don't get left behind. Because that's our problem as women. When the men are on the scene, we step back and let the men go ahead. And we have programmed that way. And that's what we work to do, to make sure that the girls don't get left behind. We don't, we don't isolate them and make them something special. We make it seem like it's normal that they're on a par with the boys. Because when they go back home, who do they find at home? The boys, the uncles, the dads. And if at, the, the, at, at Sautiku, she was lauding it and showing her big brother that she's equal and whatever, and he can, you know, he has to listen to her. Then when they go back home, he takes over, and now he's really putting her down. And the parents are now supporting it because daddy's saying, you're a girl, you should be doing what your brother says. So we try to make it very, very inclusive for the boys as well. We also, I, important is also diversity so that they're exposed to very many different, 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 different topics, different pieces of information. In this area, it's a little bit more difficult because it's a one people, we are the Luo, so it's from the same ethnic group. But what we do is we do exchange programs with the kids from the slums, for example. They come to us, and then there's a debate around slum life and ur urban life and, and rural life. What is better? Or is, is one better than the other? What are your options? So we try to expose them to know that there's so much more than what they're seeing in their own environment. And all of it together helps them redefine themselves. Take away from this African who comes from this poor country, not continent, who is you know, struggling, who can't help themselves, to a space where you redefine yourself culturally within your own culture first, and then as in a region, and then as a nation, and then as, a, as a, somebody part of this continent. We make them challenge all of these stereotypes by the fact that we tell them they're better, they're, 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 they define who they are. Yeah. So that is, that is also uh, very, very important for the work that we do. Key to all of it, like I said, is that at some point, these children, these little people, are going to be young adults who financially have to be able to manage their lives. And one of the biggest problems we have on the continent is we have so many young people. And it's a problem only because we have not be, stayed true to our promise as adults. They go to school and do everything right. They work hard. And I tell you, on our continent, our kids work hard because education is still considered something very, very important and is a privilege. So they work hard. They get the grades. You know, They put in the hours. And then when they finish, they are told, mom and dad don't have the money for secondary school. So they stop at class eight. Or mom and dad don't have the, the money for training or going to university. So they stop and have nothing. And they end up, their life ends. And it ends on two levels. Because one, mom and dad didn't prepare for you. You have your six kids. And this is me. This is how I work with my community. Because they come to me and say, oh, my child has done so well, class eight, and now they're going to second school, and we don't have the money. And I turn to those parents, again, the power of why and no. You knew this child. When they started school, they were going to finish at class eight, you had eight years, and they were going to go to secondary school, and you know it's not free. How much did you put away? Nothing. Because they're poor, but they have 10 acres of land. So I tell them, you know what? I am not going to help you this way. Because why? It doesn't make sense. 
You knew this child was going through. You, you beat them when they had bad grades going along the way because you wanted them to do so well. How did you expect secondary school to be paid? So you do not, we don't compromise and we don't let people get away with thinking, oh, but my uncle, my brother, my father, and so and so was going to support him. Because that uncle, that brother, that whatever, has also got his own children. And you've got six of them. I have one child, so, you know, I can talk, you know. <laughs> like, you know. Why? And then maybe she's pregnant. We have one child. And I talk so candidly because it's a fact. We need to stop being politically correct. I have one young person, and this young person, we actually did find sponsorship for him because he had straight A's coming from the village, walking barefoot. I mean, those ones are the stars. You don't let them fall through the cracks. So we have some of those. So he was one. His parents, his mother was on her 10th child. She was pregnant when we took him to apply for a scholarship. And they have no money, you know. So, you know, I did give them a chewing up, you know, and, and really told them. But it doesn't help because the mentality is a mentality of these children are my social security. And if not, my brother, my whoever will take care of them. So there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. And the children see this and they, they pick up. On this and actually the way we fight it is that all of the young people we have who are on scholarship in university or in school through sponsors second sponsors that we get for them we have told them and I categorically correctly say we are not educating you to educate those ten sisters and brothers of yours it sounds terrible the Africans remove will think oh god what kind of a person is she we are bogged down the continent are the best philanthropies in the world not only do we give diaspora money to the continent, but we also look after the whole family. And it brings everybody down. That is why our standard of living is so low. Because we're taking care of all these other families, other people, who are not taking the responsibility for themselves. So what I've told these children is when you're through with your... Already now, all of them, their parents have to be part of the program. They come, and because we're not just doing a grow to eat, because they have so much land, and when they really get into our projects, they start growing more and start having enough to take to market and earn money, we have a grow to earn project where we're working on their bigger farms. So they are possibilities. Poverty is no excuse. It just is using the potential and the resources that you have. So that is the one way we tell them you cannot rely on these children to improve your lives. The other thing we tell the parents is that you have to have less children if you can't afford them. You have to think that each child costs until they reach a space where they're able to look after themselves, they're self-reliant. And that is the conversation that we don't have. It's almost like taboo to have this conversation. I know that of my mom. My mom's not happy that I have just the one child. Huh? So, you know, for her, it's like a big family. So she encourages all my brothers to have several children, which they do. And I keep telling my brothers, you have several children. When it comes to secondary school, don't come to me. Because you must be aware that every child has a value attached to them. And that value is also monetary. From day one, we have very few early childhood development uh, facilities because people don't invest in that, because it's optional. Primary school is free, the other one is it, it's more likely costing in most places. So people don't want to invest in that because it's gonna cost them. But when you have a child, it costs, period. And that's something that we're trying to, the, the parents, teach them as well that they know, and this is actually a financial literacy course, we do financial literacy with them, in order to teach them how to manage money. Because again, poverty is no excuse, even with little money, you can do a lot. But that is another topic for another time if people want to know how exactly we do it, because it's working. The parents are managing to save money and to have money through the method that we are using. So we're pushing, we're pushing the boundaries that they've set themselves, the limitations they've set themselves, in order to make it possible for them to look after their children. And we tell them, we will not educate your children. We will not put them through school, but we will teach you how to make money so that you can educate your children because they are your children. And that's what it means to have children, and they are your responsibility. So we enable. The good, a good part of what Sautiku does, and our fourth pillar, is that we enable. We create enabling spaces, mental and physical enabling spaces. Mental is in your head. As you saw with the camping, we do retreats with the kids. We have a lot of forums for the boys and the girls, so we discuss issues. There's counseling. That is the mental space, allowing you to use your voice, not being afraid, you know, showing the light in your eyes. All of that is what we do in the mental space. And we're starting to do it the parents as well because they really like our program. They keep saying, why this, just the kids, why not us? So we're starting to include them in a lot of our programs. And then we make the physical spaces. This is our little one, which was just a pavilion. Now we're moving to this big center that we're trying to, to which we're building, which will have a library for information, IT lab, workshop rooms, you know, uh, accommodation, a camping site, 
a big football pitch, and a vocational center with eight different vocational skills. Because again, your resources, not just land, your resources is your intellect, and your intellect goes in different directions. It can be formal education or informal education. And our problem with all of those is first, getting them to want to work the land is difficult because they've been told whoever stays in the countryside is a failure. And they, have, they, they can't, and you see only old people, sick people, orphans, and, you know, and, and women, because their men are working in town. So changing that mindset and saying, this is something that is of value. The problem is in the schools, when they get punished, they're told to go and dig in the school garden. So for them, that is not something that they want to do. It, it's a stigmatization. Working with your hands, learning how to do, um, have craft, you know, do the vocational skills. And that's something we're still building the center, but I'm really, really looking forward to it because what's going to happen is we're going to start with the little ones doing, um, uh, in German they call it Schnupferkurse. They go and do little sneak, sneak courses just to learn how to with maybe make a table with clay so that they start appreciating what it means to work with your hands. We are all chasing these white collar jobs and we have not kept our promise. There are no white collar jobs for half of the population, well, more than half of the population. And in Africa, the continent, I, if I'm not wrong with my statistics, 75% of our people, our, our population is under 35. And in Kenya alone, it's between 15 and 30. So these young people, this potential that we have, we must start figuring out how to structure, how we can tap into this potential. So it's very, very important. A little bit to digitalization, because it's also the topic of the day. Digitalization for us here is almost a, a non-entity, because we're struggling for our office alone to get internet. Wi-Fi here, they claim it's not possible, which I don't believe, but you know, because you can, everywhere you can put up your satellites and all, but we don't have it here. The interest in the rural area is minimal. In fact, my area now people are getting interested because of what we're doing, the land around me costs like five times as much as it costs when I started, because they're all saying, well, anything near Sautiku or near an Obama has got to cost more, even if it's me who wants to buy the land. So I've shot myself in the foot there. But they're not really that keen. So digitalization is almost like a non-subject. What we do have is a smartphone for those who can afford it again, because not many can, and none of our children can. Not at all. In fact, I think we have maybe one child whose family is a bit better off and he walks around looking very, you know, feeling really hip because he's the only one with a phone and all that. And when we have our retreats, he's completely dismayed because we take it away from him because it gives the wrong message. So it's about information when it comes to digitalization for us. It's, it, it is not so much about consume because, you know, the fact that everything has gone digital is you have just a few clicks away and you can consume whatever you want. It's the, the, the instant gratification situation. We don't have that. We don't have that yet. I call it the microwave, microwave syndrome because in a microwave you put something in and in two seconds later it's done. And I'm always like, how did that happen? Normally you put it in the oven, it takes half an hour. So I call it the microwave syndrome because it just like click and it's happened. But for us, it is something that is of advantage because it is for our economic growth. If it's used at all, it's used around uh, trying to access markets trying to access health, trying to access even education, e-education. So for us, it is actually something that is very, very positive, and we will use it. We will use it. The question that is always on my mind is how are we going to control it so it doesn't become something that is negative or, 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 or closes children away from society and creates a very lonely poverty in the sense of lonely community of people who are just on their phones all the time or on their computers and all. We, we, have, we are a long way from there in the rural area. In the cities, maybe less, but in the rural areas, we are a long way from that. And maybe we will jump it, because by the time we are getting it to that level, maybe we've figured out a way of explaining it to kids as something that is just a tool and not my best friend and my only friend. We want to change that dynamic. So we are moving rather slow. But in conclusion, all of what we do is about teaching young people from a very young age, early childhood development, about first the I, it's like a circle. It's a, it's a circle of, of being. The inner circle is the I. The middle circle is the we, which is the closer community, my family. And then the outside circle is the us, which is the global, everybody. Which, in, which it has to be because of the digitization, we are a smaller community. The global community has become smaller because we know what is going on in the West much, much faster and much more specifically than we ever did before. And in the knowledge of that, and now I speak to the West, 
in the knowledge of that, we have to change the way we communicate with each other. Not just the idea of development aid and, development aid and change it to sustainable economic growth, which is what it should be for these communities, because we want to make sure they're economically stable, if that is what we're really trying to do in our work as in the humanitarian sector. We need to change that so that they become part of the economic value chain. That also then means that we share responsibility and accountability for what happens globally. I can't help but, and it seems like a cliche, I can't help my being nervous about what is happening through global warming. You know, sometimes when you talk about it, you're being stigmatized for it. But to be honest, there's so many changes that are happening. Climatic changes, you know. I was in DC three days ago, sitting, because I had an event that I was going to, and I hear this buzzing in my ear, and I'm thinking, huh, a mosquito? And I start doing this, and I'm t looking at my, my host, and I'm saying, a mosquito? This is Washington, D.C. And then, before I knew it, I had three bites, horrible big bites. It took me right back there to a country, because that's where I get bitten. Okay, Nairobi, it's also gotten warmer, so you get bitten there. Luckily, they're not malaria bites. But this is the swampy USA that they had gotten rid of the swamp, especially Washington. It's actually not just uh, symbolically. Washington was a swamp. And the mosquitoes, they had gone. And now, I was being bitten by a mosquito. This is part of what is happening to us globally. So again, in the work we do with the children at a very young age, we're talking about our responsibility. And the greatest thing for us here is, and, and, and for me, when I think of it, it just warms my heart, is we've taken the idea of poverty and turned it around. Because the community told us they're poor. They can't afford anything, they need help. You know, me with my big name, et cetera, et cetera. It's Obama country, you know. And I said, okay, you're poor. So how we're gonna help you, how we're gonna work with you, is that we're going to work your land, but we're gonna do it the way our forefathers did. The way my grandmother, not our forefathers, my grandmother's 95, the way my grandmother did. So we started, when we started the kitchen gardens, we gave them grain, but from indigenous crops, indigenous vegetables. And that grain is not gene manipulated. So when you've grown your maize, you've grown your vegetables, you take the seeds and save the seeds for the next planting season. So what has happened is all the families that work with us are growing their crops organically. And because, first of all, they can't afford GMO because GMO has to be bought every, every time you're planting, planting season. But also, we also started composting and making manure because they can't afford chemical manure. It costs money. So we take you where you are and we work with you with what you can afford. And with that, we're able to grow food uh, organically and they're able to eat healthily and look after the soil. So the thousands year of years that we kept the soil in good order, we're trying to work towards doing that because it's just about 70 years since the colonial period, since the contact with the West, and no offense there, just a reality, we started ruining the soil. We started being that poor continent. We started being that dependent people. And what we're doing with Saotiku is telling the young people and their families, you don't have to be. You still have a chance. Your soil still has a chance. You still have a chance to go back to what you had before and still enjoy the benefits of being westernized, if you want. So part of all of this, in the work that we do, we're changing mindsets. I'm concluding, I know it's time. We're changing mindsets. We're letting the children and young people take responsibility, be accountable for what is going on in their communities and with themselves. We're helping them towards employability and also to be able to actually even income generate if they don't want to be employed. So we're giving them options, the most important thing. They have alternatives to going to Nairobi and living in the slums. They can go if they want, because I left, I went to Germany, I was here for 16 years. But they need to know they have options and some of the options are better. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to ensure that these communities don't make poverty an excuse for not being able to move forward. And in the context of development aid, we try to say, don't give us fish, don't teach us how to fish, ask us if we eat fish. And this position that we take is not easy to our funders, I have to say that, because I always forget to say it, and I have to say it, because it makes it quite difficult sometimes to raise funds. We work hard at it, and we have to convince, because we don't show big bellies, snots, snotty noses, and skinny you know, arms of, of poverty-stricken kids in our work that we do. We show kids that are proud, that have a voice, that speak up, that use what they have to get what they need, that use their common sense, know how to ask why, and know how to say no. Those are the kids we work with. And our early childhood development goes on for 16 years. We start with them at four, and we finish at 25. That's how we try to combat 
the issues that we have and try to move kids forward and keep our promise to the children and young people we work with. Thank you. Thank you very much.